All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming out to the lecture. And uh, for those of you who are tuning into a recorded lecture, well, thanks for doing that too. In uh, each and every case, I hope that you'll feel free to reach out to me um, sometime in your relative later to, uh, to chat about what you've seen and heard and what you uh, agree with or disagree with. Um, as usual, I'm starting off this talk with this wonderful icon uh, by uh, Jonathan Anderson, um, stems from his UX work with uh, Nico Bryan and myself. Um, but today I also want to introduce you to another icon. There we are. Now I'm going to see if I can do that with uh, the actual controls here. Anyhow, this is the, um, it's an important icon that was introduced by a science fiction writer I really enjoyed uh, in my childhood, uh, one of the grandmasters from back in the 30s and 40s. And uh, um, the, he, he used this as a signature for the last 10 or 15 years of his life, but it's a really cool symbol um, in uh, the way we can all live our lives, trying to be informed about the world around us instead of certain about the world around us. Um, and I'll, I'll describe it in more detail as we, uh, as we go further on. Let's jump back into the more familiar items uh, in the structure of the introduction of this lecture. So today's title, what is user experience research and have you ever heard of Sturgeon's law? Um, the Sturgeon in this question is not the one that produces caviar, though the science fiction writer I just mentioned, Theodore Sturgeon, uh, did in fact produce a great book of short stories back in 1951. I think 51, called uh, Caviar, because, I mean, what is the best thing that comes out of a sturgeon? His joke, not mine. Um, anyhow, I'll be coming back to, uh, to uh, Mr. Sturgeon, and uh, we'll be talking about Sturgeon's Law as we go along today. Um, probably those of you who've talked to me uh, for any length of time on professional matters have heard me refer to Sturgeon's Law. Um, but let's get into the lecture. It is a doozy today. So today um, we're going to, as always, refer back to some ideas I've already shared in this series, um, mostly about the fact that we have these triune brains, right, three different processing systems in our skulls that compete with each other um, to process information that is being fed to them. And uh, as I've mentioned before, the way that they work at three different speeds and the things they're capable of mean that it's just a fact that we are all immersed in emotionality and in ignorance, prejudiced against new information that comes from the world or from other people or even from ourselves. And any criticism of that information that we've already taken as, as true and sacred and really important because it existed in our skull microseconds before the new information, any, any attack on that it feels often like a vicious attack on our survival. And that's, that's really important these days, because as I said in the very first lecture, we are all suffering from low level stress right now. And the effect, of, uh, the long-term effect of low level stress is that our ability to separate our emotional reactions from our logical thinking is diminished. So right now it's very easy to feel as though anyone who disagrees with you about anything is attacking you. And it's very easy to feel that any attack is a threat on your life. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit and specifically about uh, a, a few of the things that are going on in the news. Now, before we do that, quick review of the three parts of the brain. Um, our reflexes, the things that are much faster than we can think at all, those um, frame the way that we can react to anything. If your body tenses up or reacts to a bright light or to a weird sight, um, if your body reacts in some way at a reflexive level, that shapes the way you're going to react more slowly in the other parts of your brain. And those first set of reactions that happen other than the reflexes, the, the first set of pattern recognition based reactions, as I've said before, that part of the, the brain called the limbic area, sort of the central area, um, it, it shares blood flow with your strong emotions. And you very quickly in having a fast reaction also have an emotional reaction to it. And that creates biases like the ones I was just talking about. And our rational skills, which we like to think come in and allow us to process information carefully and logically, actually get to work defending our irrational, strong emotion opinions 
that were formed as a quick reaction. And we defend those opinions against anyone who will challenge them, uh, whether it's our neighbors or um, people we disagree with politically, or whether it's facts in the real world we're being exposed to, we often deny them because we are defending with all of our rational skill these pre-existing beliefs. Um, we even defend them against ourselves and our own attempt to rationally progress forward. Now, I've talked in previous lectures about how we can overcome that in order to learn, and in fact, how learning is that process. But let me just sum up what we're going to talk about today then from that three brain perspective. First, uh, our triune brain does give us this absolute faith that what we know is true because it's what we already know, whether that's uh, an idea formed in ignorance that we have or whether it's the systems that we have established accidentally or formally as per last week's talk uh, or that we have grown up in or that we live in day to day, or that we think we live in day to day. Um, to improve those systems and our own ignorance, we have to be informed by more than just our own emotional reactions. We have to get to that point where we can get past the things we're certain about and past the fears that are surrounding us. But um, it's only when we do that, that we'll be able to validate the experience of others, as I talked about previously especially when those experiences are different to our own. Now, when we can do that, when we can validate these new experiences we are perceiving, even if they are old established experiences in the world or in other people, when we can accept that new information as equally valid to the information that we currently hold and perhaps consider updating our existing beliefs with that new information. When we do that, we can change our beliefs and change our knowledge. And that, that sounds in the context of today's political environment, that sounds ridiculous, but it's not. It's how we learn to speak and it's how we learn to walk and it's how we learn to do all of the new skills we've acquired in our lives. It's just hard to remember that we can change those environments. Kids change them all the time and they exist in certainty and then they exist in the new certainty and adults tend to exist in certainty and stay there. Um, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk specifically, the topic of today's talk, uh, about other people's experiences and how do you go about understanding them if you can't even accept new knowledge. Um, and then once you can understand these experiences, how do you go about improving them? Because obviously you can't improve somebody else's experience by assuming that you already understand it. You can't even measure their experience by assuming that you already understand it. You have to start somewhere else. This process of trying to improve the experiences of others is something that uh, uh, Theodore Sturgeon or Ted Sturgeon uh, talked about a lot in his stories. And I, I strongly recommend that you check out a story of his called Slow Sculpture. It was a philosophy that he espoused more than just a story. Um, the idea that small incremental changes can cause large change overall, and that the only way you can affect society to make big changes is through small incremental changes, because people will act against big changes. They will react to them. It, it's a wonderful story, and I don't want to spoil it for you, but uh, I, I will go so far as to say, being as that the story is half a century old, uh, I will go so far as to say is that, uh, that that's the position of the protagonist, and it's a wonderfully written story. And uh, the protagonist changes their mind. So there, there's the big spoiler. The protagonist changes their mind in realizing that no, actually, taking action now might be better. So the thing about slow sculpture is that it requires you to be, to have both empathy and logic and to use them both. And as I've said before, that, that's those two different parts of the brain, right? If you're being emotional, that's the part that reacts quickly and shapes your ability to be logical, pretty much preventing you from approaching new information purely logically. And if you're being purely logical, one of the things you're doing is you're resisting the temptation to have quick emotional reactions to things. So this, this notion of using both skill sets is pretty radical, but it's certainly possible. 
so yeah, I talked to Theodore Sturgeon uh, about Theodore Sturgeon. Like I said, we're going to come back to him later. But I just want to mention Sturgeon's Law again. Um, if you haven't heard me talk about it, um, or heard someone else talk about it, or found out about it on your own, um, Sturgeon's Law is usually taken to be the idea that 90% of everything is crap. And that sounds really pessimistic, but you have to know the backstory. He came up with the idea, um, and it came to be called Sturgeon's Law. Uh, he came up with the idea in defense of science fiction. He was writing in the golden age of short story science fiction. And uh, people would often confront him, a well-established author who also wrote plays. He, he wrote television, uh, two of the best episodes of Star Trek, by my opinion. Uh, humbly felt, but loudly expressed opinion, like always. Um, he, uh, he wrote a lot. He was a very successful writer, but he was always criticized for writing so much science fiction. And his response when people said science fiction is crap was to say 90% of everything is crap. 90% of legal practice is crap. 90% of every literary endeavor and artistic endeavor and professional endeavor is crap. That's just the nature of humanity. So I, I often refer to that myself. Um, if you haven't heard me refer to it, maybe you've heard someone else refer to it. Um, but again, we'll come back to that later. One of the things we do in this lecture series is we take walks together, uh, metaphorical walks, figurative walks, imaginary walks. And we're going to take another one today, uh, a little bit different from the ones that we've been taking so far. Um, this time, instead of uh, being in nature, which is my usual proclivity when I go for these imaginary walks, or uh, like the, uh, a couple of weeks ago when we went for a walk in the cabin of a plane that was off course, um, instead, this time we're going to walk through a neighborhood that's full of people. Uh, it's sort of a nice fantasy idea right now, walking out in the street in a neighborhood, a bustling, busy, successful neighborhood. It's full of people and also filled with hatred. Because the two experiences can both exist in the same place. Specifically, I want to go back to the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Back around 1897, which is when the big oil boom happened there. And a funny thing happened as a result of the oil boom. Um, because it was a segregated oil boom which means that the people who, some of the people who were benefiting from oil money that, that continued to flow right into the Great Depression, um, some of the people who were benefiting from that boom weren't allowed to shop in most of the stores downtown. They weren't allowed to participate in the economy. So they created their own. Um, it's really kind of a nifty thing because this one time, the ability to earn a comfortable living coupled with the evil of segregation created community prosperity. Uh, literally the opposite of the trickle down economics that for some reason, people who don't understand math or logic are still espousing. And instead of, uh, money coming into the hands of the very rich and somehow trickling down to the poor, like a two-story outhouse. Um, instead of that, this is the idea that working people were making money and spent the money in their community. So if they needed groceries, they bought them from local people. And as the local people selling groceries had more success, they expanded their businesses and hired more people. And they went from living uh, lives of constant work to living lives where they could employ other people to do some of the work. And the community expanded and grew uh, with financial success and all of the other trappings of prosperity, starting in 1897 and coming to an abrupt end over the course of 16 hours on May 31st in 1921. During that 16 hours, um, 2,000 members of the Ku Klux Klan 
descended on the Greenwood neighborhood, which was often referred to as uh, Black Wall Street. And when I say they descended on it, imagine the images you're seeing these days of militarized police descending on peaceful protesters. Now imagine that would be the nice version. Literally 60% of the black citizens of the neighborhood were arrested. 60%. 2,000 members, proud members of the KKK wearing their robes and hoods, walked through the streets, drove through the streets, shooting and killing whoever they wanted burning the businesses to the ground. We don't know how many people were murdered during that 16 hours. But we know that there are mass graves. <sighs> Over a hundred years ago. 50 years ago, half a century ago, we could walk on another street, 16th Street in Birmingham, Alabama. There was a lot of walking going on. Protests had been organized against segregation by a community of activists that spread across the South and really across this country. Um, and in abiding with the law, restraining the number of people who could protest at any one time or participate in a march. Groups of protesters were walking 50 at a time between the 16th Street Baptist Church and uh, City Hall, walking and then going in and speaking with uh, government and then walking back. And the protesters included um, some people who had come from elsewhere, uh, including uh, uh, one person um, whose work at this time is very famous, I hope to all of us. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But the, the, the peaceful protesters included high school students and grade school students. And then things went wrong. The um, local chief of police was an avowed uh, arch segregationist. Um, and he used fire hoses on the peaceful demonstrators, um, bragging about the fact that you could knock them down and push them rolling along the street with a controlled stream. Um, they used German shepherds and, uh, at one point, um, he was quoted in the press as uh, saying to the police who were supporting these attacks um, that they should let the, uh, the white counter protesters come closer so they can see the dogs work. Unlike what happened in Black Wall Street, this was documented. Photojournalists were there. This was back in the days when cameras were big. Back in the days when the, the press, even if you disagreed with them, were protected by law, like the people are supposed to be. Photos started appearing in Life magazine, showing teenagers with their clothing blown off of them by fire hoses, showing teenagers uh, having their clothing ripped off of them by dogs and showing the reaction of the police and the other personnel around. Life magazine, the New York Times started carrying stories and those stories were picked up across the country and around the world, which I hope sounds familiar to you right now. And the result was a change in federal law. The result was the ouster of that police chief who believed before that that he had the job for life. Change happened, immediate change happened because the general community of America 
felt that that wasn't an attack against a small group of school children exercising their legal rights. They felt that it was an attack against the very legal structure of America. And there are many neighborhoods where those kinds of attacks are either happening or about to happen. It's been the case all around the world and it's been the case all throughout history that sometimes normal everyday streets seem normal, seem everyday to some of us are actually places of incredible hatred and violence for others. That's how different our experiences are. And as we all are seeing increasingly on the news, on the internet and in social media, there are many streets like that in America right now. And of course, if you are Black or First Nations, or if anyone you love is Black or First Nations, then you already know that every street has that risk, every neighborhood has that risk of suddenly turning into a place of hatred and violence. And you also know that your peaceful, friendly allies are usually the first to say, wait, yeah, we, we should change that. Absolutely, we should. Nobody wants that to stay the same, but just wait. Uh, this is a famous passage of a group of well-meaning individuals saying, wait. It's a letter that was published by eight religious uh, leaders in Birmingham um, in response to the protests. And uh, the words are probably familiar to anyone who's been paying attention. Normal for people to feel impatient because their hopes are, are coming about so slowly. But we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely, right? Oh, a protest, but not now and not in this way. And your dreams are coming true. It's, it's just slow. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s response um, is one of the great pieces of writing from the civil rights movement in, uh, in the United States, and really one of the great pieces of writing from around the world. It was published as a book called The Negro is Your Brother, but originally it was the text of what has become known as Letter from Birmingham Jail, which he wrote while in solitary confinement without being allowed access to family or a lawyer. Um, he wrote it on scraps of newspapers, side columns, and eventually on paper that one of the uh, jail trustees smuggled into him. And the letter is beautiful and it's powerful, and I strongly advise you to read it, especially in these days. But um, I find that this uh, particular passage does the interesting work of being tied deeply to the 1960s, uh, the late 1960s, or sorry, the mid uh, and early 1960s, because he refers to thalidomide um, and again, if you don't know the story of thalidomide, please look it up. It was given to mothers, um, a new drug given to pregnant women to help them deal with their stress. And only after it was dosed thousands of times was it discovered that it caused permanent and radical birth defects. Um, I want to share two other passages from... Uh, Dr. King's writing in Birmingham jail. When uh, he wrote this in response to that post by uh, the religious clergy from different denominations, one of the things they were doing was challenging the fact that outside agita agitators had come in to disrupt normal everyday life, which is one of the usual claims against peaceful protesters. Um, and I thought he answered it beautifully. Uh, in the first case, with a simple statement that I hope anyone can understand and agree with and take strength from. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. The next is, not the next in sequence in the letter, but the next one I want to share with you is I think the most wonderful citation of the Bible I have ever seen in an argument with religious clergy. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian aid call for aid. I'm not Christian. I um, don't pretend to be motivated by the writing in that book. 
what Dr. King was and lived his life according to it. And in this lovely short sentence, pointed that out to the people who were telling him that he should be less Christ-like in his actions. Let's go back to 16th Street and the 16th Street Baptist Church and remember all of those horrible things that happened and how these brave protests in which many people were injured and two and a half thousand people were arrested uh, to the point where uh, the jail was completely overpopulated. It was a 900 person jail and they still kept filling it. Um, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago how this changed the law in the country. What I, I didn't mention, but it would be wrong of me to leave this story and not mention it, is that um, four months later, that 16th, 16th Street uh, Baptist Church was bombed. And uh, three 14-year-old girls and a 12-year-old girl were killed in the explosion. But justice was swift, right? I mean, we can all agree that no one should be allowed to use bombs to win a political argument, not in a country that's based on human rights. The first of the four men known to be responsible for the bombing went to trial 14 years later. Two of the other men were brought to trial uh, 40 years later. Uh, one was tried in absentia because he had died in the meantime. Everyone knew who the four men were. Everyone knew they were responsible. Everyone. knew that they had destroyed public, uh, they had destroyed private property, knew that they had used an explosive inside city limits, knew that they had deliberately taken hateful action regardless of the potential loss of life, knew that they had killed four girls. It was known and nothing was done. If you think about that and really think about that, even though it's painful to think about it, even though it's hard for me to say it, but if you think about that, then you understand that some of us just expect that justice will be delayed or that there won't be any at all. And if that sounds horrific to you when I say it or when you're watching stories on the news, of people being beaten indiscriminately or perhaps very discriminately. Please ask yourself what it must be like, what it must do to you to live with that knowledge every day. And I'm gonna take a sidetrack down a personal story here because I've feared for my life in the streets. Um, I've lived in a number of places and visited a number of places where I was the visible minority who was illiterate stood out like a sore thumb, and experienced direct uh, cultural and racial prejudice um, every single day in all of my interactions, um, being loudly and violently hated for the fact that my skin was white or my hair in those days, when I had hair in the right places, was blonde. My eyes were blue. I, um, I've experienced that hatred. I've, uh, I've had to fight for my life in situations like that. And uh, I've had to run for my life. And uh, something that black people in this country can better relate to, I've had to stay really calm and really peaceful and completely, completely relaxed, despite fear and anger, just to avoid provoking people who were looking for an excuse to kill me. Some of us are living with that every single day. And even though I've been through it, it's not the same as what black people go through every single day here in the land of the free. And I don't claim for a moment that my experiences are equivalent to theirs. I can't walk a mile in their shoes, as people say. I can't because I was lucky enough to be raised in a position of ridiculous privilege. And that's my personal baseline. I was raised 
a white kid, a white male kid in a country that unconsciously favors whites and males. I was raised at a time of prosperity in my family and in my country. So I can't walk a mile in the shoes of people who haven't had that privilege. But what I can do is to listen to their stories and watch their stories and read their stories, however they choose to express them. And I can walk with them when they walk, if, if they're willing to have me come along. If, if they're willing to do that, then I can also make the effort to listen to how the experience changes because I'm there. How my privilege proves itself by changing the way people will treat my relatives, my friends, and strangers, if I happen to be walking with them. I can't possibly have the experiences that friends and strangers and family members have. But if I try really hard to think with the prefrontal neocortex that allows me to use logic, rather than the amygdalic region that forces me to react quickly with strong emotion and fear. If I think really hard and really slowly and deliberately, then I can take all of that information that I'm trying to gather, all that information that's out there waiting to be learned. And if I can accept the truth of those people, their lived experiences as equally valid to my own, then maybe I can learn without having to walk in anyone else's shoes, without having to use any other racist analogies. I can't tell you how many times First Nations friends talk to me about walking in moccasins as being a racist term. You can't know a man until you have walked a mile in his moccasins. Yeah. So there are ways to learn about other people's experiences, and that's what we're talking about today, though it may not feel like it right now. And that requires that you don't worry about what they are trying to show you. And you don't worry about whether what you're seeing and hearing and experiencing is a reflection of what you already know or what you already expect to see. Value what people are telling you. I'm not saying don't value it. But I am saying that what people will tell you will be shaped by their experience in dealing with people you remind them of in that situation. Value it. Treasure it. It's information they are giving you that you don't have. But look beyond it, too. Look for the things that they either can't or won't share with you. And try to be sensitive to that. Remember the Johari window that we talked about. That way, maybe you can try to understand what others really experience. And that's really what the scientific method is all about. I've been promising and threatening to talk about that for some time. And really what it's about is accepting that there are things you don't know, as we've discussed, and that there are knowledgeable others who can help you see beyond what you can see yourself. And there's more details to it, but that's really what the scientific method is. You, you ask a question that can be impartially disproven, in a way that lets you measure the answer in a way that you can apply. Um, follow a few basic rules, learn from that answer, use it to generate new questions, iterate, rinse, repeat. Um, that may not be what people were expecting from this talk. Maybe people were thinking this was going to be a lecture about, and this is how you conduct user experience research, but it's not. This talk is what is user experience research. And user experience research is the formal application of scientific methods to trying to understand what other people experience that's different than what you experience. If you want how to conduct user experience research, there's lots of other places to go looking for it. Don Norman and uh, Jacob Nielsen have the Nielsen uh, Norman group. Uh, they produce some interesting work on their own, but their foundation uh, does fantastic training and some training I disagree with strongly, but lots and lots of it. Uh, Jared Spool, uh, Steve Krug, these are people who've written great articles and books on the idea of how you do UX, and I recommend them unreservedly. Um, there are hundreds of other authors who have worked in the field, including me, 
that's me, one of hundreds, hoo hoo. And uh, yeah, on, on average, um, on average, our field does pretty crappy work. Um, it's uh, not just me saying that casually here. I've also said that formally in writing uh, in the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of Design. If you look it up, look up ethnographic methods, a fundamental part of user experience research. Um, yeah, basically my strongest feeling about it when asked to sum it up, and this isn't the whole article, but my strongest feeling about it when asked to sum it up was that I have to warn people that it's not well done. Which brings us back to Sturgeon's law that 90% of everything is crap. On to another topic. What defines a shape? A circle or a square? What makes one thing a circle and another thing a square? Is it the average points or is it the outliers? And I would argue that it's the outliers because when we simplify answers, they're wrong. They're, they're wrong in a way that we agree to ignore. That's what averages are. You think of the average customer, the average American, the average Whatever is not a rich and meaningful definition. You'll learn more from the outliers. But for quick and easy snap judgments using that lazy and emotional and strong feeling part of our brain, averages work really well. Make averages across groups of every sort. And it's a great illustration of one of the fundamental ways that we fool ourselves into false certainty. I have a quick impression of this. It's right on average. Ignoring the fact that people aren't averages. Really, nothing is averages. And that supports our false certainty, again, about ourselves, about the others we may or may not interact with, and about the world that's shared between those others and ourselves. It's the outliers, as I said, that define the shape of something, like a square or a circle or a family or a society, which brings me to Sturgeon's other law. Nothing is always absolutely so. That's the way that Sturgeon originally phrased the one that came to be known as 90% of everything is crap. And he persisted in saying nothing is always absolutely true. So, and he treated them as two separate ideas, the one illustrating the other, but also distinct. Nothing is always absolutely so. Avoid certainty. It's a really good lesson for all of us. And these days we have to apply it to this idea that everybody has the same experience in this country, that there is such a thing as an American experience. Because if you believe in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and if you believe that all people should be treated equally under the law, don't wait. Don't slow down now. Don't become comfortable now. It's going to be hard to resist becoming comfortable now at the slightest opportunity to do so. We see a handful of police kneeling with protesters, and it's a beautiful sight, and we want to think it's a stronger sentiment than it is, and a stronger reflection of reality than it is. It's beautiful when they do it. We hear that Minneapolis town, uh, City Council is planning on disbanding their police force because they can't see another path towards fixing it. They'll disband it and start fresh. And that sounds so inspiring, but it doesn't mean we're done. And these days, we all want so badly to be done. It's, it's our mantra now, across the country and across the world. I can't wait for things to get back to normal. But would you still feel that way if normal meant this high risk of death that we've been talking about? Because it does for our friends and neighbors and coworkers and relatives men, women, and children who are black, it means a high risk of death for them, just like it does for First Nations people and all people of color in this country, in this country that we used to believe was above that. We were fooling ourselves. It was never above that. And if it's bad for people of color, and if it's bad for blacks, and it is bad, what about the people who were even further away from the fictional average? What about people from the LGBTQ community who also happen to be people of color? The numbers are heartbreaking. Weeks ago, I talked about how young children, two-year-olds two and, and 
kids close to their age just incessantly ask why and how it must be driving us crazy, those of us who have kids. And I pointed out that that doesn't mean that you should turn to your parents and do the same thing. Why, why, why? But now you should. Now is a really good time to have that conversation with your parents. Don't be angry, but maybe be pestering. Challenge their preconceptions. Challenge their experience, not because you say they don't have that experience or because their experience isn't worthy. Challenge it in terms of whether or not it represents everyone else's experience. The hard part isn't going to be getting information to share with them. The hard part might The hard part of that might involve trying to be careful and slow and deliberate when you want to just be emotional and shout at people and react that way, but try not to. Try to carefully apply all of the resources you have intellectually to challenging people's perspective politely. It's, it's not the way we think most of the time. But again, that isn't the hard part. That's just the hard part of the easy part. <laughs> the hard part is gonna be going forward and acting on the things that you learn. Because in amongst the people we know who don't see this dichotomy of experience, there are not only people who are lost in the illusion that their experience is universal and that the old way isn't bad and that the status quo is okay. There aren't only people who are lost in that illusion. There are also people who have deliberately created that experience and continue to support it deliberately. And they're surrounded by other players who are supporting them, but not their ideas. People who are invested in keeping up the status quo because it's so scary to think of what change might be. But we can do it. We can use our intellectual minds and talk to others and help them use their intellectual minds and judge new information as equally valid to their own existing information. We can do that, it's just hard. And one of the hardest parts about it is not only confronting government or police forces or others who strongly disagree with us, but also confronting those who agree with us like those religious leaders who wrote the public letter in Birmingham back in 1963. There are allies and we have to confront them because they didn't follow the process we've gone through. They didn't follow the process we've been going through in these lectures, the processes that you've been going through individually and in whatever groups you have that supported you in this, these processes that allowed you to move away from thinking, are things really that bad? To thinking, oh my God, they're really that bad. These allies are where we were before we went through that process. And they're using all of their natural cognitive ability to justify their ignorance and stubbornness and blind faith, just like we used to do. Just like we still do on other issues. And they believe that they're being reasonable and that you're not. So it's really hard not to fall into the same pattern, not to mirror that back to them and get angry because they're being unreasonable and you're being reasonable. I do wish that we could make people think. That's one of the prime recommendations by Steve Krug, who I mentioned earlier, the user experience expert. Don't make me think, he warns people, that users will not think in the ways that you want them to. They'll think in the ways that they do or not at all. And I wish that there was such a thing as making people think. I wish that I could say or do something that just immediately sets them to using their prefrontal neocortex instead of their limbic system, to thinking deeply and carefully and logically. But there isn't, there is no trick. Instead, what you have to do is get them to feel that they can do it and that they should do it and that they can slow down and they can take the time 
and consider new information and go through that same process. And yeah, lots of people say, but just show them evidence. Evidence wins arguments. It doesn't. Remember what we talked about. It's almost impossible to quickly and easily accept new information that contradicts the things you already know are true, even when the time difference is just microseconds. It's almost impossible, but we can do it. That's what all of these lectures have been about. The fact that we are living in a time where reality is going to butt hard up against faith. And I don't mean religious faith. I mean faith that what we've heard and what we believe is true. Think of those two curves, flattening the curve, right? Think of that. Remember the illustrations I've used with it. Reality is intruding on the beliefs that we hold, including the ones that I hold that I hold deeply and don't want to challenge. And like me, if you think that you're open-minded, the, the odds are that you're not. Like me. But it's okay. It's okay that I'm not as open-minded as I think I am. And it's okay that you're not as open-minded as you think you are. Because if we're willing to try and be patient with ourselves and others, then we can get there. But it involves being less certain about all the things we're certain of and more reflective about all the things that we disbelieve. And it requires listening and learning from others and always asking the next question, which brings me to the final element of Sturgeon's Law. Ask the next question. That's what this symbol was. Ask the next question. That's what he encouraged people to do. Ask the next question, and it's what I encourage you to do. Ask those questions. Ask those questions in politics and how we can help move society forward. And also, ask those questions about user experience and software. It's the same thing. Ask the next question, and then shut up and listen to the answer. Don't tell them what you know. Don't shape their answers by what you believe. Reflect on what you're learning. And that way you can learn. Assume from the beginning that you will never know enough to be certain. And that's when you can change things, whether it's web pages or communities. And we can do it. It seems impossible to but it's not, it's just hard. And it seems that we're outnumbered, but we're not. We've just learned to listen to the wrong voices. And it seems that the system is rigged against change, but it's not. We just have to be as deliberate as our opponents. It's harder in politics than in UX, but less than 10% of the American population is politically engaged. And almost all political work happens behind the scenes. Well, we can do that, right? We can work for the short term and the long term. We can organize, we can inform others and ourselves and each other. We can write letters and emails and make phone calls and we can vote. And that way we can save our country and our future. We can make the effort to do those things, emails and phone calls and registering and vote. And we can support candidates who are willing to make those changes in the short term and in the long term, not necessarily the ideal candidate, but the one who's going to make the short term change to save us. And it is hard and it will take a lot of effort, but this is one of those really rare opportunities in human history where we can make monumental change through democracy. Now, if you'd like to participate in that, in improving the experience of your neighbors and of your family and of your friends and strangers. And if you'd like to try to develop the skill to apply all of your intellect and all of your emotional strength to solving those kinds of problems, then please do. I encourage you. And if I can support you in that in any way, please reach out. Thank you very much.